So today we will prove Fubini's theorem. Uh, so this is essentially uh, a theorem which allows you to change uh, the order of the integral. More precisely, let me describe what is the goal of the lecture. We, uh, we will start with two measure space. Remember that we are assuming that omega g is uh, sigma finite. It's mu j sigma finite. We constructed a measure, mu, which is the product measure, mu1 times mu2. And um, we will consider a function f. So f will represent the sigma algebra generated by the rectangles, which we represented by f1 star f2. So we will consider a function f, which is defined on omega1 times omega2 in R bar. You can, and I will uh, discuss that in more details, fix a point x in omega 1 and consider this function now as a function defined in omega 2. And you could, as a function in omega 2, integrate it with respect to m2, mu2. So let's assume to fix idea that, in fact, f is non-negative. So as a function of y, this function is non-negative. So you could integrate that function with respect to mu2. And I will place here y just to uh, remind you that we are integrating with respect to the variable y. Now, this is a function. This we de depends on x for each different x, we have a different value of this integral. So we could consider this object as a function of s, x. We will show that as a function of x, if f is f measurable, that this function of f, x is in fact f1 measurable. It's non-negative. So we can integrate this function now with respect to mu1, x. And uh, what we'll prove is that this integral is in fact equal to the integral of f, which is a function of the two variables, x and y, with respect to uh, the product measure mu. And this tells you that uh, since this formula is symmetric in respect to mu1 and mu2, is that, well, you can first integrate it with respect to mu2 and then integrate the result with respect to mu1, or do in the opposite uh, way, first integrate with respect to mu1 and then with respect to mu2. So this is, so the statement of Binney's theorems are sufficient conditions on the function f to guarantee this identity and therefore um, the fact that we may exchange the order of the integration. So this is the goal. So you see that uh, there is a question of measurability here. We will need to show that if I fix a point x, so if I fix the first coordinate, this function is measurable, so that I can integrate it with respect to the second variable. So I will need to prove that for any fixed x, this, x, this function, as a function of y, it's f2 measurable, and that the integral with respect to the second variable, so that this integral, it's a function, it's a f1, it's measurable with respect to f1 as a function of x. So there are two measurability problems um, implicit in this identity, and then we, we have to prove the identity. What we will do is uh, we will start with um, very simple functions, indicators. So we'll first prove um, this identity for indicators, and then we will extend it to non-negative functions and to integrable functions. So this is uh, more or less a summary of uh, the lecture today. So uh, let's start with uh, discussing measurability. So let's assume that we have a function f defined on omega, taking values on the extended line. And let's assume that f 
is uh, f measurable. So what I claim is that for any x in omega 1, the section of f at x, which I will represent by that symbol. So this uh, symbol means a function from omega 2 to the extended line, which associates to a point y the value fxy. So for any x in omega 1, fx is a function from omega 2 uh, to the extended line. And what I claim is that fx belongs to f2. Okay? So that this function for any x, so the section for any x is a measurable function. So in order to prove that, what we have to show is that if I take the inverse image of a set B, which is a Borel extended measurable, so I'm just let me remind you that I represent by B bar the um, sigma algebra of the extended Borelian sets. So I have to show that uh, this set belongs to F2 for any B uh, in this sigma algebra. Well, but what is Fx minus 1B? Well, these are all points Y in omega 2 such that f x y belongs to b. Okay, so this is exactly the uh, definition of the inverse image of a set b. Well, but by definition, f x at y, it's f x y. So this is exactly the points y in omega 2, such that f x y belongs to b. And uh, say, saying requiring that fxy belongs to B, it's exactly the same thing as requiring xy to be in f minus 1b. Now, if you call this set E, you have here exactly the definition of the x section of the set E. So the, x, the section of the set E at x, it's exactly the set of points y and omega 2 such that xy belongs to E. So this is the section of E at x, but E it's f minus 1b. Okay. So this is uh, f minus 1b the section at x of this set. Well, since f is f measurable and b is a set in the uh, extended Borel sigma field, this means that this set here belongs to f. And we have seen that the section at x of any set in the sigma algebra f belongs to f2. So this set here belongs to F2 because it is the X section of a set in the sigma algebra F. And we already proved that the X section of any set in the sigma algebra F, it's in F2. So this proves that Fx is uh, measurable because we proved that the inverse image of B belongs to F2. So here is the, the first theorem uh, I want to prove. So remember, we have two a space of measures, and I'm assuming that omega j, it's uh, mu j is sigma finite for j equal to 1 and 2, so the two spaces are sigma finite, and that I'm representing by f the product sigma algebra, which I represented by f1 uh, star f2. So now I'm taking any set E in this sigma algebra, and uh, I claim first that if I consider I represent by Ex the x section of E at x. And so this is, we have seen 
a set in which is F2 measurable, so I take its measure, and now I consider uh, this measure as a function of x. And what I claim is that this function, as a function of x, is F1 measurable. And in the same way, if I fix y in uh, omega 2, and I take the y section of E, this uh, y section is F1 measurable, so I can take its mu1 measure. And what I claim is that, well, as a function of y, this uh, measure is F2 measurable. So since this function is F1 measurable, I can integrate this function with respect to mu1. And what I claim is that if I integrate this function with respect to mu1, what I get is mu of e. And we can, of course, reverse. So uh, since this function, as a function of y, is f2 measurable, I can integrate it with respect to mu2. And what I claim is that I, we have this identity. And this is uh, the second assertion of this uh, theorem. So we will first prove uh, that these functions are measurable. And then we will prove uh, that. Um, then we will prove these two identities. So the first um, statement is that uh, this function, as a function of x, is f1 measurable. And uh, so let's prove uh, this statement. I will first. So remember, I'm assuming that the space is sigma finite. So um, let me suppose first that uh, mu1 of omega1 and it's finite, and mu2 of omega2, it's finite. So let's assume that uh, both space have finite measure, and let's prove uh, this claim. And then uh, we will just use the sigma finiteness of these spaces in order to extend this result to the general case. So um, in order to prove that, we'll proceed in uh, two steps. First, we'll prove this assertion for rectangles. So I will assume that E is a rectangle, and we will prove that this function is F1 measurable. Then um, we will extend using linearity this statement to the algebra generated by the rectangles. And finally, using the monotone class theorem, we will extend that to all elements of the sigma algebra. So as I said, let me first assume that E is a rectangle. Therefore, that E is uh, a set of the type A times B, where A belongs to F1 and B belongs to F2. So, in this case, what is the section at x of the set E? Well, the section at x of this rectangle AB, so remember, let me draw here a picture. Here is A, here is B. So if I take x in A, the cross section, the section is just B, while if I take point x outside A, the section is the empty set. So the section, it's either the set B if x belongs to A, or it's the empty set if x does not belong to A. Therefore, if I take the mu2 measure of Ex, the mu2 measure of Ex, it's equal to well, the mu2 measure of B if x belongs to A, and it's 0 if x doesn't belong to A. So this is mu2 of B if x belongs to A, and it's 0 if x does not belong to A. And I can write uh, this function as mu2 of B times the indicator of A, of x. So you see this function? It's equal to mu2 of b if x belongs to a, and it's equal to 0 if x does not belong to a. So we just proved that mu2 of ex, it's in fact a multiple of the indicator of the set a. 
And since A belongs to F1, it's clear that as a function of X, this function is uh, F1 measurable. So we proved the result by an explicit computation in the case in which E is a rectangle. So now uh, let's prove that for finite disjoint union of rectangles. So remember that uh, represented by C, uh, the set of rectangles, and uh, let me denote it by A, the algebra generated by the rectangles. So we know that C is a semi-algebra, and therefore that the elements of the algebra generated by this semi-algebra is formed by finite disjoint unions of rectangles. So if I take an element E in this algebra, E can be written as a finite disjoint union of elements of the, of, uh, the semi-algebra, which are the rectangles. So since EJ is a rectangle, let me write EJ as AJ times BJ. So AJ belongs to F1, and BJ belongs to F2. Now we are interested in the measure mu2 of EX. So E is uh, the, the joint union of EJ. So if I take the X section of E at X, this is the X section of this union. And we have already seen that the X section of a union is the union of these sections. So this is just g equal to 1 up to n of e j x. So let me represent by e j x the x section of the set e j. And but the set e j, we, we know already what is the x section of e j. It will be b j if x belongs to a j and it will be the empty set if x doesn't belong to aj. But what I'm really interested in, it's the new, well, we know that this set belongs to f1, to f2, I'm sorry. We already proved that uh, for any set in the f algebra, in the product algebra, if I take the section, it is a measurable set. So I can take mu2 of Ex. Mu2 of Ex is given by this finite disjoint union. So this is mu2 of this disjoint union, which is equal to the sum of mu2 of Ej x. And as I already said, for as we already seen, mu2 of E j x, we have seen that this is uh, a multiple of the indicator of a j. So this is mu2 of b j times the indicator of a j x. So this was the first part of the, the proof. So I can just replace um, the mu2 measure of this set by uh, this simple function and obtain that mu2 of Ex is the sum of mu2 bj, the indicator of the set aj. And this proves that um, this function, as a function of x, it's in fact a simple function 
since it can be written as a finite sum of non-negative numbers multiplying by indicator sets. So it's a simple function, and in particular, it's measurable as a function of x. Therefore, we proved uh, that this statement holds if uh, the set E is an element of the algebra. So up to this point, uh, we prove the result if E is a rectangle or if E is an element of the, the algebra generated by the rectangles. And I want to extend it now to all uh, sets E which are F measurable. So my first uh, try will be uh, to prove the following statement, which I mentioned that would be used many, many times uh, in these lectures, is to, uh, let's say, define by G all elements E sets E in the sigma algebra F, for which uh, this property holds. So we already proved that uh, G contains, say, the rectangles, which are represented by C. Now, if I can prove that G is a sigma algebra, so assume that we can prove that G is a sigma algebra. If we can prove that G is a sigma algebra, since it contains the rectangles, it contains the sigma algebra generated by the rectangles. And from these two statements, I would conclude that G contains F, which is the sigma algebra generated by the rectangles. But on the other hand, by definition, G is contained in F, and therefore I would have here uh, the identity so that G will be exactly uh, the sigma algebra F, and therefore for any set E in the sigma algebra, uh, we would have that this function is uh, measurable. Unfortunately, um, it's difficult to show that G it's closed by finite union, say. By finite unions. Or by countable unions. Because if I know that E and F belongs to G, what I know is that mu2 of Ex and mu2 of Fx are, uh, belongs to F1, are measurable uh, in X. But what I need to show is that mu2 of the cross-section of E union F at X, it's measurable. This is mu2 of Ex union Fx, because we've seen that uh, the X section of the union, it's the union of the X sections. But now I cannot express uh, the measure of this set as the sum or as an algebraic expression in terms of these measures because they might have some intersection. Of course, if they were, the intersection were empty, that would be exactly the sum, and therefore this expression would be measurable. But since uh, I have no guarantee that the intersection is empty, uh, I cannot express this measure in terms of these ones, and therefore I cannot conclude the measurability of this function in terms of the measurability of these functions. So here we have a problem, and the way to overcome this, um, this difficulty is instead of proving that G is a sigma algebra, it's to prove that G is a monotone class. And it's, uh, well, we will need this assumption to show that G is a monotone class. And since G is a monotone class which contains the algebra generated by the rectangles, by a theorem proved in the first few lectures, we know that G will also contain the sigma algebra generated by the rectangles. So we try to show that uh, a class of function forms a sigma algebra. We are not able. So instead of using that result, we will use the monotone class theorem. So let me do that. So my claim, so this is the third step. And my claim 
is that G is a monotone class. Okay. Well, so in order to show that G is a monotone class, let me assume that EN is a sequence of sets in G and say that EN increases to a set E. And what I want to prove is that the set E belongs to the class G. So um, instead of writing EN, let me write it with an upper index just to avoid mixing uh, this index with uh, this section. So since I know that EN belongs to G, I know that mu2 EN x as a function of x is f1 measurable. But since en is increasing to e, I know that the section at x of en increases to the section at x of e, and this for all x in uh, omega 1. Well, I know that mu2 is a measure. So this means that mu2 is sigma additive. And therefore, we, we know that if mu2 is a sigma additive, it's also continuous from below. Since e and x is converging to ex, so it's increasing to this set ex, by um, the lower continu continuity, we know that mu2 of ex it's equal to the limit of mu2 of e and x. And since these functions, and this is an increasing limit, and since these functions are f1 measurable, we know that the limit is also f1 measurable, and therefore uh, this function is f1 measurable, which means that e belongs to g. So this proves that e, the, set, the class of sets g, it's closed by uh, increasing limits. So now let's prove that it's closed by decreasing limits. So I, I'll take a sequence now, en decreasing to e. Again, since I know that en belongs to g, mu2 of e and x, it's f1 measurable. And these sections are now decreasing. And here's my point. Here is uh, the place where I'm using that mu1 and mu2 um, give finite measure to omega1 and to omega2. Since the measures are finite, I know that uh, for any x, mu2 of e and x is finite. And therefore, since mu2 is sigma additive, it's continuous from above. Being continuous from above and this sequence being, being finite for uh, this sequence being finite, I know that it converges to mu2 of ex, and therefore that mu2 of ex is uh, measurable with respect to x. So let me repeat. Um, maybe it wasn't that clear. So I know that en decreases to e. This implies that the sections are also decreasing. And now I want to conclude that mu2 of e and x, it's converging to mu2 of e x. What I know is that mu2 is sigma additive, and therefore it's continuous from above. But the continuity from above will tell me that this sequence converges to that number if this sequence is finite starting from some uh, index n. But this sequence is finite for all n because I'm assuming uh, that mu2 of omega2 is finite, and these sets are all contained in omega2. So I can use the continuity from above at ex to show that um, this sequence is converging to that one, to that, uh, to the measure, mu2 measure of ex. So since uh, these functions are f1 measurable, the limit is f1 measurable. So mu2 of ex is f1 measurable. This means that e belongs to f, which proves that uh, g the class of sets G, it's closed by um, decreasing limits. 
which proves that G is a monotone class. So, since G is a monotone class, I know that G contains the algebra generated by the cylinder sets, because this is what I proved um, in the second part of the proof, in the second part of this argument. By the monotone class theorem, G must contain the sigma algebra generated by this algebra, which is F, the product sigma algebra. And therefore, G contains the product algebra, but it's also contained, and therefore it's equal. And this proves that any set E in the product sigma algebra is such that mu2 of Ex is F1 measurable. And that concludes the proof, provided we have uh, these two assumptions. So in the, the final part of the argument, I want to get rid of these two assumptions. And for that, I will use the fact uh, that these two spaces are sigma finite. So since these two spaces are sigma finite, there exists a sequence An of elements of the algebra such that omega 1 is equal to the union of An and mu 1 of An is finite. And also there exists a sequence uh, Bn of elements in the algebra. So this is the algebra of um, sets uh, in F1. This is the algebra of sets of omega 2 such that omega 2 it's equal to the union of Bn and the measure mu2 of Bn, it's finite. Again, I will put the index uh, as upper indexes. So now let me consider E, a set in F. I will take, um, let me represent by maybe uh, Fn, the set An times Bn. So this is uh, an element of the a rectangle cylinder set. And mu of Fn, it's equal uh, to mu1 of An, mu2 of Bn, which is finite and also the union of the sets Fn are equal to omega 1 times omega 2. Okay, they are clearly contained, this union is clearly contained, and if you take a point um, in omega 1 and a point in omega 2, and if you assume that these sets An are increasing, which uh, we can always assume, and that the sets Bn are increasing, it's easy to uh, check that any point in omega 1, omega 2 belongs to all Fn starting from some index n. So I will uh, take here the restriction of E to A and B n, or to the set Fn. So this is uh, a new set, and now I can apply, well, the set, this set has finite measure because Fn has finite measure. I can take uh, the section at x of the set. I know by the first part of the proof that this function is um, f1 measurable for any n. And once, um, once I know that these functions are all measurable, the section at x of this section, since these sets fn are increasing, they are increasing to the section of the limit, but the limit of the fn are just omega 1 times omega 2. So the sequence of sets are increasing to the x section of the set E, and therefore mu2 of this set, it's increasing to mu2 
of Ex, since uh, these functions are all f1 measurable, the limit is also f1 measurable, and this concludes uh, the proof of um, the first part of the theorem. Now let's prove um, the identities. So what um, we want to prove is that if I take this uh, non-negative f1 measurable function and I integrate it with respect to mu1, what I get is uh, the set mu of e. And um, well, here again, I will proceed step by step. So I'll prove that for rectangles, then for elements of the algebra, and finally, um, for all sets by using the monotone convergence theorem. So let's proceed step by step. Let's first assume that E is a rectangle, so that E is equal to A times B. So we have seen in the first part of this proof that Ex and mu2, in fact, of Ex, it's equal to mu2 B times the indicator of the set E X, of, I'm sorry, the indicator of the set A, X. Okay, in the first part of the proof, we have seen that if E is a rectangle AB, where A belongs to F1 and B to F2, then mu2 of E X was equal to mu2 of B times the indicator of the set A. And therefore, if I integrated that with respect to mu1, this is the integral of mu2b times the indicator of a d mu1. Well, and this is just the integral of a simple function. So this is equal to mu2 of b times mu1 of a. And this is, since a times b is e, this is just mu of e. And this proves uh, that identity in the case in which um, e is a rectangle. So now let's assume um, that e is an element of the algebra. So this means that e is equal to a finite union of E j, where E j is our um, rectangles. So we have seen that mu uh, 2 of E x is equal in that case as the sum of mu 2 of E j x, where uh, these sets E j x are all, remember, uh, rectangles. So if I report that in this identity, what I get is that um, mu 2 of E x, d mu 1, so this identity is the identity we proved in the first part of this argument. So this is equal to, by that identity, to the sum. Now I will use linearity in order to exchange uh, the order of the sum with the integral. Well, now I will use the first part of the proof. The first part of the proof tells me, the, of this um, item B, the first part tells me that this identity holds if E is a rectangle. But each EJ are, is a rectangle, and therefore this integral is mu2 
mu, I'm sorry, of Ej. Okay, because we proved already that for rectangles, this identity holds. Since Ej uh, is a rectangle, <coughs> we have this identity. And now we know that these sets Ej are the joint two by two, and their union is equal to E. So the sum of the measures of Ej is equal to the measure of E. And therefore, we proved uh, this identity in the case in which the set E is an element of the algebra. So up to now, we proved um, this identity for elements of the um, for rectangles, for elements of the algebra. And I want to conclude now that it holds for any um, set E in the sigma algebra. So as for the first uh, part of the proof, we'll um, first assume that, say, the set omega 1 and omega 2 are have finite measure. So let me first assume that mu of omega 1 and mu of omega 2 are finite. And again, let me represent by G the set of all uh, sets E in the sigma algebra for which the identity holds. Where my, here is the identity. <coughs> and I claim that G is a monotone class. OK, so, um, well, let's assume that En belongs to G. And let's assume that En increases to E. I want to uh, show that E belongs to G. Therefore, for that, I need to show that E uh, satisfies this identity. So since I know that En belongs to G, what I know is that mu uh, 2 of E n x d mu 1, it's equal to uh, mu of En. Well, now since En increases to E, and since mu is a measure, this expression increases to mu of E. Um, in the same way, since En increases to E, the section at x of En increases to the section at x of E, and therefore this uh, function, as a function of x, increases to mu 2 of Ex. Right? So this is just by the fact that mu and mu 2 are measures, and that these sets are increasing, therefore we are using here uh, the fact that the measure, it's continuous from below. Now, uh, since we have here a sequence of non-negative functions which is increasing to a function, by the monotone convergence theorem, this integral, it's converging, that integral, it's converging to uh, this integral. So here I'm using the monotone convergence theorem. Well, since these two expressions are equal, their limit must be equal, and therefore we have that mu e is equal to uh, the integral with respect to mu 1 of the function mu 2 of ex. So this proves that this identity holds for e, and therefore that g is closed by um, increasing sequences. The same argument, or a similar argument, will show that G is closed by decreasing sequence. So let's assume now that En is decreasing to E. Since En belongs to G, 
this identity holds for any n. Now, since E n is decreasing to uh, E, and mu it's a finite measure, because I'm assuming here that uh, mu1 and mu2 are finite measures, since mu is a finite measure, we know that this sequence is converging to mu of E. And uh, by similar reason, since mu2 is a finite measure, we know that this expression is converging um, to mu2 of Ex. Right? Here, we are using the fact that mu and mu2 are measures, and therefore, they are continuous from above. And to pass to the limit, I need to guarantee that um, this sequence is finite starting from some index. But in fact, these two sequences are finite because we are assuming that uh, the measures are finite. So we can uh, pass to the limit here. And for the function, so this function is decreasing to that function. But these functions are all bounded by mu2 of omega2, right? The section at x of en is certainly contained in omega2, and therefore uh, this function is bounded by this constant, which is finite by assumption. And therefore, instead of using the monotone convergence theorem, I can now use the dominated convergence theorem in order to pass to the limit. This is a sequence of uh, functions which are bounded by an integrable function, because mu1 is finite, so this constant is integrable, and therefore I can use the dominate convergence theorem to pass to the limit in this expression. And since these two, two expressions are equal, their limits are equal, and therefore mu of e is equal to this integral, which proves that uh, g it's closed by decreasing sequences, and uh, which concludes the proof of the theorem in the case of finite measures. So now uh, it remains to remove this condition, and for that we will use the assumption that omega 1 and omega 2 are sigma finite. So again, uh, I know that I can write omega 1 as a union of sets a n. where a n is an increasing sequence which belongs to the algebra and mu 1 of a n is finite for all n. And the same thing uh, for omega 2. So I can write omega 2 as an increasing sequence of sets b n. So b n are increasing and uh, mu2 of bn it's finite and um, what else do I need? I need that bn belongs to the algebra. Okay. So this is uh, our assumption on omega 1 and omega 2, they are sigma finite so I will take fn as the set an times bn. Of course, uh, the measure mu of fn, um, let me write that here, mu of fn is finite, because mu of fn is uh, the product of mu1 an mu2 bn, and both are finite. fn is an element of the algebra, because while well, it's the well, it's in fact an element of a, it's a rectangle function because it's a n times b n, where a n and b n belongs to their respective sigma algebra. So in fact, I should have written here 1 and here 2 for the algebra with a1 and the algebra a2. And uh, moreover, omega, which is omega 1 times omega 2, it's equal to the union of fn because, well, a n and b n are increasing sets, and therefore it's easy to show that omega is equal to um, this sequence. So now, if I take um, the set E in the sigma algebra F, and I take its uh, intersection with Fn, 
Fn is in fact uh, giving mass, so I, um, what I'm doing here is that I'm defining new measures as the measures restricted to the set Fn, which is a set of finite measure. So I can apply what I proved to this set. So what I claim is that um, it follows by the last step in our previous argument that mu2 of E intersection Fn x d mu1 it's equal to mu2 mu of E intersection Fn. And uh, well now, so this follows from what uh, we proved in the case in which uh, the measures are finite. And now we can pass to the limit as n tends to infinity because since uh, Fn is increasing because An and B, Bn are increasing and since their union is equal to omega by the fact that mu is um, sigma additive and therefore it's continuous from below, this expression converges to mu of E. This one, for, by the same reasons, converges to mu2 of Ex. And by the monotone convergence theorem, the integral converges to uh, the integral with respect to mu1 of this function. And therefore, we have this identity. And this completes uh, the proof in, uh, under the assumption that these sets are sigma finite. All right, so um, now let me prove theorem 2, which um, is assume that I have a function f, which is f measurable and which is uh, non-negative. And um, so this theorem is known as uh, Toninelli, Tonelli theorem. which is Fubini's theorem for non-negative functions. And uh, what we want to prove is that uh, the integral, so we've seen that if I take a section at x of the function f as a function of y, I, if I integrate that with respect to mu2, so um, this function is measurable, so it's non-negative, so I can integrate it. And now if I integrate this function with respect to mu1, then this is equal to uh, the integral of f with respect to mu. And uh, well, and in particular, it tells you, since this expression is symmetric, that we can also take the function f, its section at y, consider that um, as a function of x, which is a f1 measurable function, integrate it with respect to mu1, and now um, integrate this expression with respect to uh, mu2. So um, there are, in fact, two claims here. The first one is that this function here is um, f1 measurable. And that the integral of this non-negative f1 measurable function with respect to mu1, it's equal to this integral. So we have to prove uh, the measurability, and then we have to prove the identity. And uh, we will do that by considering first f as an indicator, then as a simple function, and finally passing to the limit and proving um, this identity for all non-negative functions. So proof of Tonelli's theorem. Well, so let's first assume that f is uh, c times the indicator of e. Now, in this case, if I take um, the cross-section at x of this function, 
this is the cross section of this function. Well, but C, it's a constant, so uh, this is C times the cross section of this function. And uh, so this is C EX. So if I now integrate this function as a function of y with respect to uh, mu2, right? So I'm integrating, I'm fixing x, and I'm integrating uh, this cross section of the function f in y with respect to mu2. By this identity, this is just c times 1 the uh, indicator of the section at x of the set E. This is, um, well, C here, I'm taking a non-negative constant. So this is bilinearity C times um, the integral of this uh, set with respect to mu2, which is mu2 of Ex. And therefore, uh, we have seen already that this function as a function of x, it's f1 measurable. So we have the measurability of this function as a function of x. And now we can integrate this measurable function with respect to mu1. So let's integrate this function with respect to mu1. Well, this is uh, the integral of this function with respect to mu1. So by linearity, I can remove c out of the integral. Then I have the integral of this function with respect to mu1. And by our first theorem, this is just mu of e. And c times mu of e, if you remember that f is the integral of c, f is the function c times the indicator of e, this is just the integral of f with respect to mu. So we proved uh, also the identity between uh, this integral in which I first integrate the second coordinate and then the first one with um, the integral of f with respect to uh, the product measure. So uh, the theorem holds provided f is uh, a multiple of an indicator function where e here, uh, I didn't say but I hope it was clear, it's an element of the uh, sigma algebra f. So we proved uh, the theorem in the case in which f it's a multiple of the indicator function. So now let's assume that f is a simple function so that uh, f is equal to uh, a sum of cj, the indicator of ej. Well, now I will not forget cj are non negative uh, real numbers and ej are elements of the sigma algebra f. So um, if I take x in omega 1 and I consider the um, function fx, so let me call that uh, maybe fj, and let me put an upper index. So this is uh, the function, which is a sum from uh, j from 1 to n fj of x, so I'm fixing x and I'm considering this function as function of y, so this is clear that this is equal to the sum f j x, right, and um, now I can, so I express this function as a sum of sections of 
um, indicator, so multiple of an indicator. So I can now, I get uh, immediately that uh, this function, which, uh, well, I already know that these functions are F2 uh, measurable, so I can integrate this function with respect to mu2. Right? Uh, this was the first uh, result we proved that these functions are F2 measurable, but they are equal to these functions. So I can replace Fx by Fjxy d mu2. I can use uh, linearity, so this is equal to the sum Now, uh, by the first part of the proof, I know that these functions, as functions of x, are f1 measurable, right? Because fj is a multiple of an indicator. So by the first part of the proof, these uh, functions are f1 measurable. The sum of f1 measurable is f1 measurable. So I get that uh, these functions are f1 measurable. So this was uh, the first claim, and then there is a second claim about the identity. So let's take these functions are clearly non-negative because I'm integrating a non-negative function. So let's integrate this non-negative function with respect to uh, mu1. Right, so... Uh, since this function is equal to that one, I will integrate this function with respect to mu1. Let me use linearity to get um, the sum outside the integral. So this is, right, these functions are all uh, non-negative because c, j are, is non-negative and these are indicators. So they are all non-negative, the integral is non-negative, so I can uh, exchange finite sum with um, these expressions, and here I get uh, the integral with respect to mu1 of the integral of fx j y d mu2 y d mu1. Right. So these functions fj, as I said before, are multiple of indicators. Therefore, by the first part of the proof, I know that this integral, and let me write it here, so this is equal to sum from 1 to n, and let me use uh, the first part of uh, the proof to say uh, that this integral of this integral is equal to uh, f j d mu. Right? And since it's integral, uh, we have this identity. Now I can move the sum inside and then use the fact that um, f is equal to the sum of fj to replace the sum of fj by f. So this is equal to f d mu. And again, I have um, proved the identity, but now for uh, simple functions. So now let's um, consider the case of a non-negative function. So let's assume that f is non-negative. And for that, I will approximate f by um, an increasing sequence of simple functions. So let me take fj, simple functions, and fj increasing to f. Right? So um, if I take the section at x of fj, since fj is increasing to f, these sections are increasing to the section of f at x. Therefore, um, by the monotone convergence theorem, if I integrate fjx 
with respect to mu2. These are non-negative functions, which are increasing to that non-negative function. So by the monotone convergence theorem, this sequence is converging to f x d mu2. The functions f j are simple. So I proved already uh, that as a function of x, these integrals are f1 measurable. And therefore, the limit is f1 measurable. And this proof, um, the last claim regarding um, measurability, which means that if I take any non-negative function, I take its section at x, I integrate the uh, second variable, and the result as a function of the first variable is f1 measurable. Now I have to prove the identity. Well, these are non-negative functions converging to this non-negative function. So I can apply again the monotone convergence theorem to say that this sequence it's increasing to um, the integral of um, this expression. So this is again by the monotone convergence theorem. But for each j, fj is a simple function. And by simple functions, we know already that uh, this integral, it's equal to uh, the integral of fj with respect to mu. Right? This is by step two. We know, since fj is a simple function, that we have this identity. Well, since we have uh, this identity and fj is increasing to f, Using again the monotone convergence theorem, we have that this expression is converging to f d mu, and therefore that f d mu is equal to uh, this limit, and this proves this co completes the proof of Tonelli's uh, theorem. Now let's prove uh, Fubini's theorem. So here I'm. Again, we have two space, measure spaces. I'm assuming that they are sigma finite. We prove that if f is non-negative, we have uh, this identity, and we have the measurability of these integrals. Well, I'm replacing the assumption that f is non-negative by the assumption that f is integrable. Right? And then we, we have a problem because I'm assuming that f is uh, integrable, so that f is equal, uh, let me say, let's take the positive part of f and the negative part of f. Since uh, f is integrable, what I know is that f plus d mu is finite. By Tonelli's theorem, the integral of f plus, which is a non-negative function with respect to mu, it's equal. So let me write that as this is finite. It's equal to the integral of I'm taking f plus. I'm taking its uh, section at x. I'm computing that with respect to y. I'm integrating with respect to mu2 and then with respect to mu1. I know that this function here, it's f1 measurable, and that this f1 measurable function has a finite integral. So this tells me that this function here is finite almost everywhere. Right? Because it, if it were infinite in a set of measures, positive measure, that integral will be equal to plus infinity. So that the fact that f is integrable tells me that um, f plus x d mu2 is finite 
for almost all or almost everywhere in terms of x, mu 1. And the same thing uh, can be argued with respect to f minus. The problem is that this integral can be equal to plus infinity at a point at which the f minus is also plus infinity. And in that case, I will not be able to define what is d mu 2, this integral minus that one. Right? It might happen that there exists an x for which this one is equal to plus infinity, and that one it's equal to plus infinity. And uh, therefore, I will not be able to give a sense to this difference. And I would like to give a sense to this difference in order to uh, make the integral of fx with respect to mu2 appear in this identity. So uh, to do that, I will replace this function by a function which is equal to that at almost every point, and it's zero otherwise. So let me uh, give this definition to uh, turn this statement into a precise statement, a correct one. So, uh, what I will do is I will define g plus of x. This will be the integral of f plus of x y d mu 2 if this integral is finite and will be 0 otherwise. Right? So this means that g plus x will be equal to that integral if this integral is finite, and it will be 0 otherwise. Okay? So we know that this function is f1 measurable, that this set um, so here, what I want is if um, f plus x d mu 2 is finite. Right? This set here, since this function is f1 measurable, this set is uh, in f1. And therefore, the function g plus, which is this f1 measurable function times the indicator of an f1 set, is also f1 measurable. So I know that this set is f1 measurable. I can define in the same way g minus, imposing here a minus and here a minus. And now uh, I can make sense of g plus x minus g minus x. Right? I know that g plus is equal to this function almost everywhere because this integral we have seen it's finite almost for almost all x. So these two functions, g plus and this integral, are equal almost everywhere. But the advantage of g plus over this integral is now that I can make sense of um, this function. And I will call this difference as g of x. And what I claim is that g of x d mu 1 is equal to uh, the integral of f d mu, where g of x is defined as this difference, where g plus and g minus are defined by this expression. So this is now uh, Fubini's theorem. If you take any integrable function, what I claim is that, well, this function g, uh, which is given by this expression, it's clearly f1 measurable. This follows from Tonelli's theorem. And that the integral with respect, so this function g, I claim it's integrable with respect to mu1, and it's integral, it's equal to the integral of f with respect to mu. So this is the statement that we, I will now prove. So let me give you a proof. So I'm assuming that f is integrable. So this means that f plus and f minus are integrable. 
and by Tonelli, I know that the integral of f plus x du2, that this function integrated with respect to du1, it's equal to f plus d mu, which is finite, because f is integrable. So this means that this function here, it's integrable. So the function uh, f plus x d mu2, which I already know by Tonelli's theorem, it's measurable, f1 measurable, but it's also integrable because it's integral with respect to mu1, it's finite. So this is a f1 integrable function. And therefore, if I define g plus of x as equal to the integral of f plus x d mu2, if this integral is finite, and zero otherwise, so this function f, uh, this function g plus, it's, um, so let me call e um, the set of x such that f plus x d mu2, it's finite. So this set, this function, it's f1 measurable. So this set e, it's the inverse image of minus infinity to plus infinity, uh, the inverse image of this function, of this interval. Therefore, it belongs to f1. And the set g plus is therefore equal to this integral times the indicator of the set E, and which is therefore F1 measurable. And since um, the set E complement has measure 0, because um, since this function it's integrable, it's finite almost everywhere, so the integral of G plus d mu1, it's equal to the integral of this function, which is finite. Therefore, g plus, it's an f1 uh, measurable function, which is integrable. And the same thing uh, can be said to g minus. So if I replace everywhere plus by minus, I get that g minus is also an f1 measurable function, um, which is integrable. Now I want to show that uh, the integrals are equal. So let me prove now the identity of the integrals, which is uh, Fubini's theorem. Well, by definition, f d mu, it's equal to f plus d mu minus f minus d mu. Since f plus and f minus are um, non-negative, by Tonelli theorem, this first integral is equal to the integral of f plus x d mu 2. d mu 1 minus, by the same reason, this is equal to the integral of f minus x d uh, mu 2 d mu 1. And um, now, since we have seen that this function, it's almost, it's equal almost everywhere to the function g plus, this is also equal to uh, g plus d mu 1, because these two functions are equal almost everywhere. 
And uh, by the similar reasons, this function is equal to g minus almost everywhere. So I can replace that integral by g minus d mu 1. And now, uh, since g plus and g minus are both integrable, and since uh, g, minus, g plus x and g minus x are never equal uh, to plus infinity at the same point, because, well, they are finite, g plus of x is finite at all points x, and g minus is finite at all points x. So I can make sense of g plus minus g minus. And since uh, these functions are integrable by linearity, this integral is equal to that one. And this is exactly what I called uh, g. So what we proved is that the integral of g d mu 1 is equal to uh, the integral of f d mu as um, claimed in Tonelli, so in uh, Fubini's theorem. So this proves Fubini's theorem, and uh, which is, a, as you've seen, a simple consequence of Tonelli's theorem. One just has to be careful um, because you cannot take the difference between this integral and that one because they might be equal to plus infinity at the same x. So you just have to uh, make a small modification in order to avoid uh, that problem. And this is why we introduced uh, the function g plus and g minus. But in any case, uh, this tells you that you can exchange the order of the integration provided the function f is integrable. So uh, let me finish this lecture with a, a remark. We proved the Fubini's theorem for f integrable. So now I want to replace uh, that assumption by another assumption. So let's assume that I have a function f, which is uh, f measurable. And let's assume that we know that if I take fx and I take the absolute value of fx with respect, so taking the section, so I'm taking this function as a function of y, I'm integrating that with respect to the second variable, and then I'm integrating that with respect to the first variable, and assume that I know that this is finite. I claim that in that case, uh, the conclusion of Fubini's theorem holds. Then uh, the, I will not write it again. I just will write that the conclusions of Fubini's theorem are in force. Right, and why is that so? Well, because if I take f, the positive part of f plus, I take its section at x. This is clearly bounded by the absolute value of the section at x. And the same uh, statement is true if I take the negative part. So both the negative and the positive part are bounded. So this means that uh, f plus x d mu 2 d mu 1 are finite, both for plus and minus. But I know by Tonelli theorem that uh, this expression is equal to the integral of f plus d mu and f minus d mu. So this condition implies uh, that these integrals are finite, but these integrals are equal to that one. So I know that these integrals are, in fact, finite. And if these integrals are finite, this means that f is integrable. And therefore, we just proved that this condition here implies that f is integrable. And therefore, we can apply uh, Fubini's theorem. So uh, to apply Fubini's theorem, either you show that function f is integrable, or you take its section, you take the absolute value of its section, and you show that the integral with respect to one variable and then the other one is finite. And in that case, you allowed to exchange the order of the integral. And let me insist that this is one of the most used theorems. So in life, you'll be many, many times faced with um, uh, multiple integrals, which order you would like to change. So you will apply either Tonelli theorem 
in the case of non-negative functions or Fubini theorems in the case of integrable functions. And this completes uh, this lecture.